You are listening to the Visualizing War and Peace podcast. In each episode, we look at how people have experienced, described, or imagined armed conflict in different periods and places. And we discuss the impact which representations of war and peace can have on us as individuals and societies. Hello, my name is Alice Koenig, and I direct the Visualizing War and Peace project at the University of St. Andrews. Over the past few weeks, our podcast has been looking at how we talk about and understand forced migration, one of the many legacies of armed conflict. We've been interviewing a range of people who've been displaced by war themselves, and we've also been talking to artists, photographers and academics about their efforts to change public perceptions of the so-called refugee crisis and help others visualise what forced migration involves. I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Wahid Aryan, author of In the Wars, an autobiography published in 2021, which narrates his own journey of forced migration from Afghanistan to the UK. Wahid was born in Kabul, Afghanistan in 1983, and his childhood was dominated by the Soviet-Afghan war. His family spent years fleeing the fighting, especially after his father was conscripted into the army, and they took the difficult decision in 1988 to escape to Pakistan, which involved a hazardous mountain journey, dodging terrifying airstrikes. Their troubles were not over once they arrived in Pakistan. Their cramped, difficult living conditions resulted in Wahid becoming seriously ill with a combination of malnutrition, malaria and tuberculosis. That experience and the medical care he received inspired Wahid to start dreaming of becoming a doctor. Wahid and his family returned to Kabul when Soviet forces eventually withdrew from Afghanistan, but civil war rapidly broke out, and as the Taliban's grip on power increased, Wahid's parents became increasingly concerned that he'd be recruited as a fighter himself. So they made arrangements to send him to the UK. He was 15 years old, and on arrival as a refugee, he was immediately imprisoned and sent to the Feltham Young Offender Institute. Against all the odds, Wahid learned English, took on multiple jobs in shops and restaurants and studied in the evenings, gaining the A-levels required to read medicine at the University of Cambridge. From there, he became a doctor, specialising in radiology, and he now works on the front line in accident and emergency in the NHS. Aware of the ongoing need for more medical support and training in Afghanistan, Wahid has set up a charity called Aryan Teleheal, which now has over 100 volunteer medics based in the UK who advise medical colleagues in Afghanistan and elsewhere using smartphones, social media and other everyday technologies. He's also become a powerful advocate for refugees in the UK, which is what we're going to focus on in our conversation today. Wahid has been recognised for his charity work by multiple organisations, including a UN Global Hero Award in 2017, a Rotary International Peace Award in 2018, and the UK Prime Minister's Points of Light Award in 2018, among many other achievements. He has recently been featured on Desert Island Discs, and his story was told in a 2017 BBC documentary narrated by John Simpson, among other high-profile coverage. Today, he's a much sought after speaker internationally, reaching political leaders all around the world. So I am super grateful to him for finding time in his incredibly busy schedule to speak to us on the Visualising War and Peace podcast. Wahid, many thanks for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I'm really looking forward to the conversation too. Thanks very much for having me. So I know that you want the focus of this podcast to be on issues that refugees currently face and the support that they need to thrive and not just survive if they're lucky enough to make it to a place of safety. But I wonder if we can begin with you just giving us a very quick overview of your own story of forced migration. Perhaps you can pick out two or three aspects of it that help us understand the kinds of journeys that many refugees have to make and the work also that forced migrants have to do to belong and to succeed in their adopted countries. Yes, of course. Well, this is my entire memoir, so I'll try to summarize it as much as I can. I was born in Afghanistan in uh, 1983 during the Afghan-Soviet conflict and spent 15 years of my childhood, actually, being born into war, being raised in war, surviving bombs, shellings and rockets, and then being displaced uh, before I made it to the UK as a child refugee age 15. The first five years, I remember only a couple of happy memories from those five years. One was being taken to a local park by my mother to um, have an ice cream with my cousins. And another one is when my father, he knelt down to give me a big kite and then he suddenly disappeared from our lives because he had to flee from the military service. The rest of the time was us spending in cellars from the rockets, bombs and shellings. And outside we would hear the noise of tanks and the jets in the sky. From time to time, we would see my father in faraway villages. And that would be an absolutely magical reunion that he would appear out of nowhere. Um, so on one hand, 
the refugees and forced people who make it to safety, they suffer from that sort of constant trauma of war. And it manifests itself in so many different ways. The visible ones that I mentioned is, is obviously that you see all the tanks, the jets, and then you hear it, the noise of the shellings, the bombs. Then you see that your loved ones are absolutely torn into pieces by bombs. Um, you hear that people are no longer there who used to be around you. So that all takes that psychological toll on people, physically, of course, as well as psychologically. On the other hand, it is that constant feeling of loss reunion, which I mentioned through my father, uh, us meeting him and then losing touch with him and suddenly meeting him again. Those are sort of like few examples of the sort of traumas that I remember from the first uh, five years uh, later on. And then we migrated to Pakistan as refugees, like millions of other Afghans. Normal borders were closed, so we had to take very dangerous routes through mountain valleys and rivers at nighttime on donkeys and horses. That took us seven days and seven nights. We had to take the journey at night because any activity that was seen during the day, the helicopter gunships and the jets would come in and destroy anyone and anybody. And sadly, we did come under the attack three times. One time, I remember being hidden in an oven floor, um, in, in, a, in an oven that was set in a floor that's usually used for baking in villages. And my father, he covered me in his arms and before the jets arrived, we were spotted by a spy plane and he knew the jets would come in. So that was uh, his way of trying to, to protect me. And he told me that, son, uh, if anything had happened to him, that I would be taking my family and I would be responsible for the family. And from that day onward, I remember that kind of I lost my childhood. That I became responsible second person, a second in command, if it were, for the family. But then I remember the bullets flying over our head and the, the rockets hitting the building when we were in that oven. And those are the sort of traumas that 30 you know, odd years later, I still remember very, very vividly. And uh, that's the same for other refugees. Again, when they make it to safety, they come in with so much trauma that every day is a fight for survival, physically, mentally, for their loved ones as well. Then when we made it to a refugee camp in Pakistan, in that camp, like millions of other Afghans who were scattered in various other camps, we were safe from the bombs. But the conditions were absolutely inhumane. As a family of eight, we were living in a tent, which was later upgraded to a mudroom, with temperatures rising up to 45 degrees, uh, very little food, hardly any clean water. Most of us suffered from malaria and tuberculosis. They nearly killed me, but my interaction with the doctor was something that inspired me to become a doctor myself later on to uh, heal people. Because on one hand, I saw so much suffering from uh, ourselves, but also the people around us. Many of them were suffering more than we were. But on the other hand, I saw that how actually humanity can heal. There are people who can actually help people live and, and feel better. Then when you made it back to Afghanistan in 1991, we returned back when my father was above the military age, so he didn't have to serve. But sadly, the civil war started in 1992. Between 1992 and 96, we had to again flee from one part of the country to another and back and forth to Pakistan, flee, really street by street fighting that was raging across the country amongst the various Mujahideen groups. The schools were destroyed, hospitals were destroyed, and most of the time I spent in cellars with my family. And it's back in those cellars where most of my self-education happened, using a lamp and sitting under the desk on one hand, sheltering from the bomb on the other hand, trying to make what was in front of me from any books that I could lay my hands on from the streets of Kabul. And from time to time, I would listen to the BBC World Service to practice my English because I had a dream to become a doctor and perhaps to build a new life somewhere. And that new life, uh, I couldn't see it. I was born into war. I didn't know any other reality. But I know that it existed. And hanging on to that hope each day was a method for me to survive. I would create this imaginary world that I would be going to school, that I would be having dinner with my family, and I would be able to make friends, play. Uh, all those things that um, many people take for granted was a dream for me that dream in, in my mind to be able to survive. Uh, and I also combined that with exercise to help me mentally cope. 
the first time I suffered from depressive symptoms, actually, was when I was uh, between the age of uh, 10 and 12, because I just couldn't make sense of the world. I lost appetite. I was waking up early on and I was losing hope. But somehow I was hanging on to, to that little bit of hope that my future would be okay. Taliban took over between 96 and 99. The economy crumbled more and I didn't have a future and my life um, was at risk when I got to the age of 15. And then sadly, my parents had to make a decision uh, to send me away to a safe country where my life would be safe. And I would be able to realize my dream as well to do something with my future. And they had to put all the money and their fate into the hands of an agent to send me away because the official routes were not available. And they're still not available. People who want to flee conflict zones, they have to take really, really dangerous route wherever they are in, in the world to make it. And many people, sadly, they lose their lives as well. But if you think about the alternative, the alternative to them is no life actually, or rest of their life and, and, and having no future for themselves and their families. So they're, they're not given many choices. So Wahid, you've just painted a very powerful picture there of a childhood dominated by war, by terror, by displacement. And I think it's very important that we note that that's displacement within your own country, that's displacement within your own region to Pakistan, and eventually, as we'll come on to, displacement to the UK. And you talk movingly of a lost childhood, you know, from the age of five upwards, you had the sense that you might be responsible for your family if your father were to be killed. But even before that, you'd kind of lost your childhood to war. And you really itemize in some ways the some of the many different manifestations of trauma that a child with your background, your experience is likely to encounter trauma, physical sickness, disruption to education, self-education, but also your dreams, your hopes, this oscillation in a sense between loss and hope, but dreams keeping you alive and giving you purpose. So the, the core dream that you had was to become a doctor and you and your parents realised that as well as avoiding being conscripted to fight in the civil war in Afghanistan, that your best chance of realizing that dream and then being able to provide for your family was for you to go to the UK. So I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about that. We, in your book, you open your autobiography in the wars with the moment of arrival where you were arrested uh, by immigration authorities, incarcerated briefly. You went through the process of achieving refugee status, having your asylum application accepted. But I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about that journey, about that journey to not just securing safety and arriving in the UK, but that journey to belonging in the UK. So when I made it to the UK in 1999 as a 15-year-old child refugee, I came in with uh, no family support, hardly any education, $100 in my pocket. But I did come in with a lot of determination, a lot of hope for safety that i had heard that people in Britain are compassionate. I'd heard it from some friends who'd made it. And uh, that I would be able to study and to make a life for myself and contribute. That's all I came with. I didn't come in with uh, many other expectations or wanting, demanding things. And that's the same that applies to other refugees. The initial or primary hope is for safety at the human right. And the second one is to be able to realize their potential uh, and the potential of their children, to realize their dream, and to be able to contribute. Um, Refugees are extremely determined people uh, through my journey, which is one example out of millions of other refugees, uh, forced migrants. Hopefully it illustrates that we don't have opportunities to do something with our lives. All our lives are spent, or, or most of it is dodging bombs. And when we make it to safety, we come in with a lot of that resilience built in with us. We come in with a lot of determination to do something for ourselves and for, for the humanity. But sadly, I also came in with uh, symptoms of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and, and many forced uh, migrants, they, they come in with that. Again, I illustrated some of the traumas, but some others, they may experience different traumas. The result is that they will have had a lot of that you know, psychological impact from war, displacement, and associated factors. But for them to be able to integrate it's really important that uh, we take into account the mental health. I wasn't screened for my mental health. And it took me nearly a decade to self-diagnose when I 
became a doctor. So from 99 to 2001, I continued working you know, three jobs to be able to support myself and my family back in Afghanistan. They included uh, sales, cleaning, kitchen porter, and I combined that with uh, studying at night time in three different colleges. And so I got the A grades required in 2003 to get into Cambridge University. And uh, 2006 was when I graduated uh, with a first for my research. And I came to Imperial College in London to complete my studies. But throughout that time, I did suffer. Socially, I was isolated. I, I suffered academically, although I didn't give up. But I uh, realized soon that I was at a huge disadvantage in comparison to other students because I really didn't have much of a school background. Um, so I had to learn a lot of things. And uh, the PTSD kept impacting my life um, in London when I was on the streets. Uh, the red buses would turn into tanks. In the middle of the night, I would wake up in sweats and really having these nightmares, seeing that a sniper would be taking my head off. I had to open the window to see for myself that actually I was uh, in a safe country. I was not in Afghanistan. And I was constantly hypervigilant. So these are the classical signs and symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And now when I work with refugees and forced migrants, I sadly see that a lot. I also see the impact of trauma as a physician. I work as an emergency medicine doctor in the, the NHS, very proudly serving and giving back to, to the country that has adopted me, the United Kingdom. And I see people suffering from trauma post-pandemic as well. And I relate to that. Although their journeys are different, each person has a different journey. But the impact of trauma it can be extremely debilitating. In my case, I managed to get out of it the other way, and but many people, they sadly don't make it out because we don't have the resources available, the systems available in the NHS, uh, as well as privately, to provide services for people who are traumatized. We don't have the trauma-informed care that is culturally sensitive and that's uh, individualized for each person, which finds the basis of my motivation, actually, to be working on our own well-being. You know, to provide that really comprehensive mind-body service using our mental health experts, clinical psychologists, and therapists who are trauma-informed and who are culturally, who can provide culturally appropriate therapy and assessment. Wahid, thank you. Through your own story, you've helped us visualize a whole range of challenges that refugees face, not only on their journey, but if they have found a place of safety, processing the trauma of their displacement, of the triggers that caused them to migrate in the first place and wrestling with that alongside trying to integrate into society and build a new home, build a new life, survive and ideally also move on to thrive. And listening to you talk, it, it's really striking that you, even as a 10 year old boy, had to rely on yourself and sort of self-help around your mental health and that it took decades for you to find the support, to find a diagnosis. So can we talk a little bit more about Arian Teleheal and Arian well-being? So as you say, you're a doctor, you're working on the front line in the NHS, but you have also founded the charity Arian Teleheal, which uses smartphones, social media and so on to deliver healthcare in Afghanistan and elsewhere abroad. It would be brilliant to hear a little bit more about that, but also to hear specifically about Aryan well-being and the kind of support that you think needs to be developed around mental health, culturally sensitive trauma-informed support, as you put it, to support refugees dealing with the kinds of experiences and circumstances that you yourself dealt with. When I graduated as a doctor in 2010, I started working in the NHS, uh, and that's when I started feeling actually better. Uh, as soon as I started giving more to my adopted country, to helping people, I started receiving some therapy as well. And all along that time, dealing with my PTSD, I was doing exercise and I was also uh, having this routine of uh, regularly checking in, making sure that I was thankful for the opportunities that I now had, actually, which I didn't have as a child. So these were my self-help mechanisms in the UK. Back in Afghanistan, uh, I used to mainly rely on exercise was a glimmer of hope here and there, actually, was to help us survive from one day to another. And some of that would come in from my father, who would say that, oh, there's something new happening. They would be listening to uh, the news on a small radio, uh, to BBC Pashto uh, and Farsi, to find, actually, to look that there is something happening. And he would break that news, he would magnify that to the family. So you do need people like that in the family to keep marching you on. Uh, and, and there is a lot of that resilience in, in 
people who are suffering from trauma and conflict zones, the elders in the family, they take that position. My late mother was absolutely a rock. She would actually go hungry to make sure that we would have some food. Um, uh, and likewise, my father as well. It, the amount they suffered, it's absolutely unimaginable. The amount they sacrificed physically and mentally to make sure that they would protect the children uh, as much as possible. Each family is different. Each person is different. The way they shape the reality around them is how people find resilience, actually. It's not that the, the environment may be the same for each person, bombs, loss, uh, displacement, but each person finds their own little way of uh, shaping that lens of how they're seeing. So that really forms that resilience building there. And they rely on each other a lot. A lot of families closed one. There's a lot of giving compassion amongst those families when they go from one place to another. You can just walk into a stranger's house and they will welcome you. They will share the food with you and then their shelter with you as well. They will cry with you. And that is a sense of relief for people. Sadly, there are no really trained professionals, not many or hardly any actually, uh, in psychiatrists, clinical psychologists and therapists on the ground to help people. Certainly not the ones that I saw at that time. And back in the UK here, I had a breakdown in 2009 because I was running on a fight or flight response mode, which is a typical response mode from the basis of post-traumatic stress. Even though that the stressor is not there or the threat is not there, your system still physiologically thinks that the threat is there and it keeps running away or keeps fighting, which are what I was doing. So 2009 was when I actually I ran out of that system. Uh, I couldn't hold on or suppress my emotions any longer. I couldn't integrate very well. I didn't fit into the society. I couldn't talk about the dramas or the holidays that other students would be going on. And hence, I was a very, very isolated person. Although I was succeeding academically, finally, and I was realizing my dream, but I was sacrificing a lot. And that's when I realized that I really have to look after myself to make sure that actually I can find the support. And I went and found some therapy. Uh, and along with that was that giving back to the NHS on the front line and going back and forth to Afghanistan to see my family and also to help in hospitals in any way I could. All those went on to uh, help me process some of the traumas and to heal. Uh, so that giving and compassion, self-compassion and giving compassion to other people uh, for me was the basis actually of self-help uh, alongside with professional help and exercise. In 2015 was when I founded a charity called Aaron Talihil to connect the collective compassion of doctors in the NHS to medics in Afghanistan to start with. And later on, we extended that to Syria, Africa and other countries and that is uh, on using mobile phones. So it's uh, telemedicine that the medics in the NHS and now across the world, they give life-saving advice to medics in Afghanistan and the conflict zones and other low resource countries to save lives and also to help them emotionally, with emotional health. Uh, and through the pandemic, then I realized that so many people have suffered actually from mental health. Of course, it's something that's very close to my heart. And I saw people, they are waiting for months and now more than a year actually to even to get somewhere to get an assessment. So I see them coming in with a crisis after crisis uh, using negative coping mechanisms like excessive alcohol, uh, sadly self-harm mechanisms, uh, suicidal attempts. And I looked into that more and I saw that actually there's a huge gap here that we don't have really trauma-informed, really expert-led mind-body solution, which can provide culturally really appropriate responses as well. And understanding the problem, identifying the gap, and knowing how people experience this problem is the basis of our own well-being for me. That I spoke with clinical psychologists and uh, accredited and licensed therapists who are trauma-informed. So we have been working with them alongside the personal trainers who are trauma-informed as well, and we're training them. All of us coming together and providing all the lessons that I've learned in digital health to put it on a smartphone and to launch it um, hopefully in the next couple of months. And this will be available to everybody in the, uh, in the UK, so we're test launching it here. But our big vision is actually to reach out to hard-to-reach populations. That includes refugees uh, that includes the homeless so we're hoping to be working with the councils uh, with the nhs and other organizations as well to provide that mental well-being support to everyone uh, including actually the um, 
staff, the healthcare colleagues who are so traumatized, as well as the other social workers who are facing traumas as well, dealing with really populations. Yeah, wow. I mean, clearly a huge need for this kind of work and so impressive that you're pulling it together. And I'm really struck by the the way in which things are sort of coming full circle. In your book, In the Wars, you write at one point, the charity that I'd founded was not only helping others to heal, it was healing me. And it's interesting to hit you pull that thread out of your story, your own journey of self-help, turning into a journey of contribution and helping to others, all of that informed by your experience of trauma, leveraging that experience to support others. You've touched a couple of times on social isolation, on other challenges of integrating. Refugees generally experience barrier after barrier. They experience physical ones when they flee their former home, trying to make their way to a safer destination. They experience administrative barriers when they're trying to secure asylum and the right to stay in a new country. And then all sorts of social barriers when working to integrate into a new community. So based on your own experience, how do you think that we can improve the support offered here in the UK beyond providing trauma-informed mental well-being to help refugees find their feet once they've arrived and, and to facilitate their integration? Well, first of all, I, I would say that there, there is a lot of kindness and help in the community. And that is something that really inspires me every day. Although we are surrounded by quite a lot of negative news that makes headlines, but the kindness doesn't make headlines. So I think we have to really look into that as well. And I'm proud that I'm living in a country where I see that in every pocket, every corner. And secondly, with regards to refugees, those migrants, each one of them has such a, an individual story, an individual set of experiences that really need a holistic approach that is physical health, that's mental health, and that's social well-being. So that's how I can broadly categorize. Although there are pockets of help everywhere, but how do we bring that all together to make sure that it forms a system? that each um, asylum seeker and refugee actually goes through that. Some of the treatment that we see, for example, being put in detention centers and for uh, them to suffer from really outbreaks, uh, for asylum seekers to be put in hotels. Although on one hand, one might think that they're safe from bombs, but really they've suffered so much trauma that they could really do with better living conditions. They don't need to be in a, in a hotel room that costs you know, a couple of hundred pounds a night. They will be happy somewhere that costs 20 or 50 pounds a night, but at least if the family can live normally and live somewhere that they can feel that there is some sort of normality. And for me, that took a long time to feel that life is normal. And for many people who are going through that journey at the moment, who are still in hotels and detention centers, that normality is not there. So we can't look at it and say that they are safe and that's it. We're giving you a hotel, we're giving you food, you should be happy. Normality is how would you want to be treated with your family if you were to be displaced? If that's how we reverse that thinking, and it's, it's easier for us to find actually the solutions. We would want us to be safe from bombs, obviously, but then we would also want to be in a home environment that feels like home. We want our children to be able to go to school. We want to be able to find jobs, to support the family, to give back, to live a meaning life. So for many people who are not able to start work, to go and find the education, that is a very sad time. Of course, the, the trauma is another aspect that slowly they need to open up and in a safe environment, and they need that expert support, that uh, trauma-informed expert support. So these are various aspects that I touched upon. But if we just put ourselves in the shoes of forced migrants, it's easier to think what kind of a life would they want. And, and then designing those solutions, it, it doesn't have to be expensive. It's simple, safe, and meaningful life. Absolutely. And it's imagining it was us and that right to normality, not having your children in a school, but then having to move them two months later to another school in the north of England from the south because you've just been moved from one local authority to another, for example. And I think one of the other things that I'm picking up from your story is you've talked about refugees as having a right to safety, but also actually having the right to dream. And the way in which your story reminds us that having purpose really makes a huge difference to one's well-being and to one's integration. And so being in a situation where you're able to build purpose and 
pursue your dreams and realize the hopes that normal people are able to realize without really thinking about it. All of that's very important. As a refugee yourself, of course, you not only play a crucial role in the NHS, as we've said, you've made huge contributions in both the UK and abroad with your charity work. Um, we're all aware of other high profile refugees, such as the athlete, Samo Farah, Lord Alf Dubbs, who escaped Prague on the kinder transport, just to name a couple. But setting famous people aside, what kinds of contributions do countless refugees in the UK make every day to our society, our economy and our cultural life? I know you've talked elsewhere about the special characteristics of refugees, and it's something you've touched on a little bit here. But I wonder if you can just talk us through the kinds of contributions that refugees make on a daily basis to society. I'm uh, absolutely one example of those countless refugees. There are more than 100 million post-migrants, sadly, now. We don't need to necessarily just pick on the ones who are uh, in a public domain. Yes, they can narrate, they can their stories, but each story is different. And I have to say that in every corner of the society, refugees play a crucial role. Anywhere you go, from lorry drivers to bus drivers to people who are running shops, engineers, lawyers, doctors, or even those who don't work, but they are there to be really peaceful neighbors in the community. They're all contributors. They're all people who bring in diversity, they bring in their ideas, they bring in their way of looking at life differently is how we can make our society really rich, meaningful, and learn from each other. Another big example is the NHS in the UK is built on diversity. Its large workforce is migrants and refugees. And I'm very proud to be working alongside them shoulder to shoulder. And I've worked throughout the pandemic. And that's how we managed to stand up to the pandemic. All the key workers that we've seen actually working, risking their lives, they were coming from a very diverse background. And that was a time that was a threat to all of us. We acknowledged with clapping, and that clapping was not only for a certain background, it was for everybody. So I really hope that we remember how we managed to defeat that when there is a time of big threat nationally and globally is when we all come together. So I hope we actually know that the war is a national and global threat, whether it's war, whether it's persecution or global warming. It could be us one day having to leave our country and go somewhere else, become refugees. So it's not something that is a phenomenon only resides in one area and quite remote from us. It could be any of us any day. So having that understanding, having the compassion and having that um, resonance with our universal human values is how we can go forward and put it simply as using our innate compassion to be able to help people. It helps those people, it helps society and it heals ourselves. Yes, as you say, kindness doesn't make the headlines, but it does make the world go round. So, Wahid, you've touched on so many important aspects of the refugee experience, of how we might visualise forced migration and refugees in future. And I, I just want to come back to that as my final question, if I may. As you know, our project is about different habits of visualising refugees and forced migration. So how do you think refugees are currently viewed in the UK? And what, if anything, would you like to change about how we understand and how we talk about forced migration? I think in the community, there is a, a good understanding. Of course, the community is not homogenous. I mean, there are people who have got views opposed to, to migration, but how their views are actually opposed are largely actually shaped by you know some sections of the media, by some politicians, and some people who do all that actually to weaponize, to really use refugees. That is a sad part that criminalizing in a way, to weaponize or politicizing refugees because they don't have a voice has become a bit of a norm, actually, not only in the UK, but across the world. And that's where some of the division actually stems from, some of the hatred that stems from. And it's very easy to do. I'm in a privileged position that I can speak with you and I can speak to the media to inform and educate and inspire. But many of those refugees have their own stories that can't be told for obvious reasons. So that's where we need to really take caution is that to have an understanding of how those refugees should be treated compassionately, kindly, we should see them as people who have got dreams, who have got hopes for safety, who have got aspiration, they've got their loved ones uh, coming here, ones who are left uh, back home, wherever they're coming from. Uh, and one day they become contributors, they become innovators. I'm just one example of that. So if we have that sort of an understanding, promote that understanding through the media, through word of mouth, through podcasts like this, that would be amazing. 
But I have to say that large populations that I've seen in the community, they have understanding already. They have that compassion. So we have to just increase that and keep telling those stories, individual stories or collective stories. And we also know now that the war doesn't just come from Middle East. People don't just migrate from countries that are far away from us, like Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen. It could happen to any country. It could happen in Europe, America. And we've seen an, a very sad example in, in Ukraine, but how the lives of millions of people was actually completely devastated overnight, over months and months. There are millions of uh, Ukrainians who've lost their homes, some of them their families and jobs, everything they had built, and then are forced to go to migrate to many other countries. So it's something that it's not out of touch. And we have to remember that the causes of post-migration are actually very much a reality and it can touch any of us. Absolutely. And having that sense of empathy and understanding, you know, not labeling refugees as refugees and having that be their identifying characteristic, but understanding, viewing them, visualizing everyone as human beings, sort of universal humanity, that understanding that the forces that trigger one person's forced migration might trigger another person's in a, in a different time, a different place. And as you say, understanding that people coming from different countries with different backgrounds, sometimes very traumatic backgrounds, but with different life experiences have a huge amount to contribute to society partly simply because of who they are as individuals partly because of those experiences of survival of resilience of learning of seeing the world through different eyes and really understanding the net contribution um, that forced migrants make in any society particularly in the public sector as you have done Thank you so much for talking to me today. It's been a real honour to discuss these important issues with you. And I'm very grateful to be taking the time. Thank you so much uh, for uh, inviting me and for having me to be able to tell my story and the story of um, other forced migrants. Thank you. Thank you also to you, our listeners, for joining us again. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Wahid Aryan as much as I did. If you want to find out more about Dr. Aryan's story, I strongly recommend you read his autobiography, In the Wars. It is one of the most compelling, moving and inspiring stories of migration I've come across. And as he's just said, listening to and sharing different people's stories of migration is one of the ways in which we can improve refugee experiences and support everyone who's been forcibly displaced from their homes. You can find out more about Dr. Aryan's charity, Aryan Telehil, via his website, www.drwahidaryan.com. Do keep tuning into our podcast. As I said at the start, we have a series of episodes coming out, all exploring different aspects of how we visualize forced migration as part of our wider work on war and its aftermath. You can find out more about our project through the website and the link is in the episode notes. If you have any questions about our work, please do get in touch. You can follow us on social media, just search for Visualising War, or contact us directly by emailing us at viswar at standandrews.ac.uk. If you'd like to support our project, please share and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever platform you use so you don't miss an episode. And please do leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps people find the show. Our theme music was composed by Jonathan Young. The show was mixed by Zafir Gertin. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>